Lord Mayor, Lady Mayoress, um, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me as Provost of Gresham College to welcome you to this lecture this evening, which is the last lecture of the academic year. And it's um, very appropriate, therefore, that we have our president to deliver it. Um, and we are most grateful to the Lord Mayor and the Lady Mayoress for allowing us to use their house uh, this evening. Um, probably, well, not perhaps the most splendid house in the UK. I'm sure that the Queen would probably demand, uh, have that claim, but uh, a very splendid house indeed. Um, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce Michael Bear, the Lord Mayor, um, whom I've known for some time through City Connections and University Connections and he has a very strong record of um, public and charitable service. Uh, around his major career as an engineer and a property man and he's had a relatively recent career but a very rapid rise through the corporation. He became a common council man in 2003 and uh, Lord Mayor only seven years later. So, um, but I think everybody who knows his work, uh, which is physic, which he's going to tell us about uh, the physical regeneration of a very important site, uh, knows the impact that he's had in the city in uh, this way, as well as through his civic career. He's, like many Lord Mayors, he has uh, taken a great um, role this year as an envoy for this country and for the city and he tells me that this is the 751st speech that he has delivered during his year of office. So we're delighted Michael that you have uh, taken the time and, and um, agreed to do this. We hope it's a relatively recent Gresham tradition, city tradition, that the President, the Lord Mayor, gives such a lecture um, and we very much hope that this will be continued by your successors. But may I now ask you to deliver your lecture. Uh, the title is very obvious, Spitalfields Opportunity Through Regeneration. Michael. Thank you very much, uh, Provost. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to my humble council house. Um, as a property person, um, I'm taking advice, but I might exercise my right to buy. <laughs> We're quite enjoying it here. But anyway, it's great to be able to de deliver this, this lecture. And uh, it's such a wonderful part of the world, the East End and Spitalfields, that I thought it would be more interesting if I did it by way of some slides, because a picture tells a thousand tales. Um, and I'm going to waltz you through... Uh, the history of Spitalfields starting 2,000 years ago. So um, what I'm going to do, a brief introduction, Spitalfields through the ages, uh, the drivers for regeneration, uh, the regeneration process, which in fact is what I uh, majored in myself from 87 till the present, and then give you an idea of what the future holds for the city fringe uh, regeneration in that part of, of London. So I actually got involved in Spitalfields uh, in uh, 1991 myself, although my companies, uh, the Spitalfields uh, 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 Development Group, comprising three private sector companies, that's Costain, Balfour Beatty and London Edinburgh Trust, uh, formed themselves into the group in 1987. So although I worked for the group, I only got, became the chief executive in, in 1991. So I will lead you up there and then I will take over um, uh, from hands-on experience in the trenches, so to speak. So where are we? Spitalfields um, adjacent uh, to Broadgate. Bishopsgate runs up here. So this is the 13-acre site and you can see the outline of the historic um, old Spitalfields market, the flower market here. Um, and as part of the regeneration scheme, we had also acquired a site in Whitechapel uh, to provide off-site uh, social housing. So the location again, just an aerial shot, um, cheek by jowl with, with the city, just across uh, um, uh, Bishopsgate uh, from Liverpool Street Station. 
um, and just a couple of shots, the old and the new together as the city changed. The site, 2,000-year-old um, site, it started off um, in, in medieval, well, it started off a very long time ago, but the, the first remains that we found were, were of a Roman cemetery, and we found a lot of Romans buried along the uh, Roman road, which was Bishop's Gate. And uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, the word Spitalfields comes from the word hospital fields, because um, St. Mary Spittal was a 12th century hospital, medieval hospital. Uh, and in those days, you didn't go to be cured. You normally went to uh, spend the last uh, days of illness and then um, unfortunately passed away. So we found a huge burial site there. And uh, what we found uh, during the excavation, over 10,000 skeletons that we had to, to deal with. They weren't meant to be so many. Uh, that's one of the joys of being a developer. You find all sorts of things that are not meant to be there. 1666, the site was used just outside the city uh, for people um, to escape uh, the fire of London and as a refuge for those who had lost their homes. It then went through a period where it was an artillery ground and thus the names Artillery Lane and Gun Passage. Uh, so during the excavation we found lots of artillery shells, uh, 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 musket balls, etc. It became in 1682 its first market, non-conformity. What that basically means is that to conform, you had to be a member of a livery company. If you wanted to trade outside the city, uh, this was uh, seen as a non-conformed market. So a lot of fruit and veg and uh, meat traders went outside the city, and in 1682, it got its first le letters of patent. Um, large immigration started in the 1700s. The French and the Flemish uh, Protestants arrived, uh, fleeing persecution, and silk-weaving expertise that they brought with them um, started that, um, that, that uh, a world famous um, location for, for that. In the uh, late 1880s, Jewish settlement came in from Eastern Europe and the sewing machine was invented, lots of um, uh, occasions for sweatshops and uh, the, the, the trade for uh, clothing happened there. And then a very entrepreneurial man, Rupert Horner, who was a market porter uh, in what was starting to be the Spitalfields area, um, bought a lease on the market and he built uh, the Horner buildings, which form part of the periphery of, uh, of Spitalfields. Um, and then more people moved in, it became an arts and crafts centre, um, what we would call SMEs, started there. 1900s brought in settlement from the Maltese, the Irish, the Scots, the West Indians, Somalians, and more importantly, in today's terms, a very large Bangladeshi community arrived. 1920, the city acquired uh, control of the market. Um, and in the 40s, uh, the uh, uh, wonderful spirit uh, of the local people, they bought a Spitfire fighter plane uh, to, uh, called Frutation, um, which was great a part of history. I thought I'd put that in, but a light relief. Um, eight, uh, then I took over, um, or, or the Spitfields Development Group took over in 1987. So I'll be talking in detail about the period here from 1987 uh, through to the, to the present. So um, uh, that's what I will be doing. So if we look to see how, how it has changed. In fifth, this is a copper plate map at the top here, 1550. And you can see St. Mary Spittal. This is the, uh, the hospital. Um, that still existed then, the fields of, of Spittal fields, and you can see there wasn't much uh, by way of residence or, 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 uh, or business. And you can see how the city moved northwards. Spittlefield started to be a defined trading area in 1676, um, uh, uh, although not a market itself. 1747, you can see the, uh, the market starting to take some shape here. And in 1894, you can see the Horner buildings having been built uh, on the periphery here. So that gives you an idea of how the city moved up and you can see here the Victorians had carved huge swathes for their railway lines that went uh, all the way through here. A bit isolated, heavily industrial uh, fruit and veg market started to, be, to, to operate from 1894. These are the sorts of scenes you would have seen in those days. That's typically uh, how they used to trade Big crates used to arrive and they used to sell from the crates, a typical wholesale market. Commercial street, uh, pretty, pretty uh, a congestion charge didn't work in those days, but it was pretty, pretty busy. And this is typically a bird market um, in the Spitalfields area. Just to show you, these are original photographs 
that we got from the, the library. So now we're moving um, you know, uh, to, to, the pre to uh, 1987. What were the drivers for regeneration? Well, the local community um, had arrived. The Bangladeshis were there, lots of local communities, rather been left um, uh, uh, on the sidelines of mainstream society. A lot of social exclusion, economic poverty, and there, there was a glass wall, metaphorically speaking, down the middle of Bishopsgate, which separated the city, the wealth of the city, from the fringe area. Very few people moved across, and that was a challenge to break down that glass wall that separated the wealth of the city uh, with uh, the East End and to enable um, regeneration and the multiplier effect of uh, spending power to go across the road. To give you an idea of the population in those days, you can see from 1800 through to 2000, and you can see this period here when the docks were starting to be very popular, people at the Port of London, population was on the increase, and then just after the war, during the recession, population decreased, although um, the sites were still there, lots of empty sites, empty buildings, uh, heavily bombed during the war. So basically the population decreased, but lots of empty, vacant sites. So it was quite a bl blighted area, and that gives you quite a good indication of how it peaked in the 1900s as the ports were important. And this graphs it in a different style. So you can see uh, how um, the change of population uh, really, 1940 basically was, a, was, a, uh, uh, was the, the least uh, amount of movement in the area. Then it's, it, it has slowly um, uh, increased uh, there. Educational levels, you can see, peaked again in the 70s and then decreased. And this is a real challenge for regeneration. How do you educate? How do you get the level of educational attainment up? And you can see uh, that uh, I won't claim that Spitalfield did all of that, but we were responsible for part of that uptick. Um, education and qualifications go together and you can see here that uh, as we measured this in impact assessments from 1950s you can see that it was a real problem with unqualified people in that area. This is an interesting, uh, interesting uh, table. The Bangladeshi community uh, was about 58.1, uh, uh, 60% against an average in to 133. So a huge concentration of um, of poorer Bangladeshi families living there uh, with a lot of other um, ethnic minorities as well to give you an idea of the composition and the challenge. Life expectancy for the average male uh, starting at the bottom, 70.5 years uh, of age was the uh, life expectancy in 1998 to 2002 against a London average of 75 and a, ta and a ta Hamlet's average of 72. You can see it's increased due to well-being and a lot of uh, effort that has gone in to, uh, to health and PCTs. But that was where we, we were uh, when the regeneration program started. Not a good story at all. Another table, we call it multiple deprivation. This is an index that measures deprivation across all of the areas. And the way this works is if you look at the number of wards, there are 8,414 wards in England. So housing was the most deprived in Spitalfields. Uh, that's what a number one means. And income was the 15th lowest out of 8,000 wards in, this, in, in, in the whole of England. And you can see these other metrics. It shows that really it was quite a desperate place um, to start off with. Uh, one of the most interesting things, and I always find this fascinating, is the graphical, uh, geographical access to services it's pretty high up there, as in the city of London, which is a comparator, which shows that the city fringe is but 500 yards from the city. So it's all there to do, uh, uh, being in the city fringe, but these are the difficult challenges uh, that we had to deal with. This is by way of dark colour means deprived, uh, and light colour means doing pretty well. The Corporation of London, the square mile, is, is there, and this is for employment. So the darker is the highest unemployment and Spitalfields is in this dark area here for unemployment and in this dark area here for multiple deprivation. So you can see that the wealth of the city and you can see the city fringe uh, really quite a, um, a marked contrast just across these roads, Bishopsgate, can make a huge difference. You'll also notice, and this is not a political point, but my ward of Port Soken which is a little sausage shape here, is also uh, in that band of, uh, 
of, of, uh, of metrics which uh, needs a huge amount of uh, attention, although it's in the city. So that was um, drivers for regeneration, why it was so necessary in the East End. As far as the city is concerned, there were different drivers. And the drivers for uh, regeneration of Spitalfields, um, as far as the city was concerned, is as an expansion of the city, the demand for more modern office space um, so that we could remain a competitive financial and business centre. Uh, so that was the main driver from the city. Uh, the local community had different drivers, were more, more social, socially um, and economically driven. So just to recap then, the 1980s, from the city's point of view, companies needed new office space, column-free space. Um, the Big Bang um, was happening, 1988, um, 89. So different sort of um, space was required. Canary Wharf was seen as a competitor uh, where they had um, much more freedom in terms of the uh, floor plate that they could provide. The city didn't have this uh, capacity, so uh, the city was really striving for those sites where they could provide for themselves and their stakeholders flexible floor plates. So we're now in 1987. The city owned the freehold of the Spitalfields fruit and veg market. Uh, but it was almost impossible uh, to run it as a fruit and veg market because of congestion, noise, um, the streets were quite narrow, lots of complaints, and so it was in, in, in fear of closure. Uh, there was a threat of closure for, for Spitalfields Market because it just wasn't operating, um, and turnover was down uh, below uh, uh, um, uh, 50 million pounds. So that was really quite a dire time. Uh, the site provided, as I said, a potential for the city um, to, uh, to, to provide space for redevelopment. But because it was a statutory market, been, um, it had been uh, operating as a market for over 300 years, an act of parliament was required to move the market. And I'll go into that a bit later. Um, and as I mentioned, the group that won the beauty contest to redevelop or regenerate the site was called the Spitalfields Development Group a consortium uh, down the bottom there of Balfour Beatty, Costane and London and Edinburgh Trust. So that's the site as it would have been in, uh, as it was, should I say, in 1987. Um, and you can see the narrow streets, so huge articulated trucks would come down here causing mayhem to residences. This is Broadgate just about being completed. Um, and, um, and that's another view with beautiful Hawksmoor Church um, and, and uh, uh, a bishop's gate down, down this end. At this time, and I put this graph up because it shows the dilemma for property developers. Not that anybody should ever feel sorry for property developers, but this will give you an inkling. This is the cycle. Now, if only we'd known that this graph would look like this, we would have acted very differently. But we're in 1987 now. In 1987, you could see it was a rising market, and so we were prepared to pay top dollar for this site to develop modern floor space for a, a, an occupier demand that was there. What we hadn't reckoned on is that the Act of Parliament would be delayed through to local protest. And the local um, protest delayed the Act of Parliament before we could start developing by 18 months. And 18 months took you to exactly the wrong time. So you can see we were on the downturn. So it just goes to show that uh, as well as location, location, location as the mantra for property, it's timing, timing, timing. For the Lord Mayor, it's loquation, loquation, loquation. <laughs> uh, and, and you can see how the world moves. So we missed the market, and in fact, it, 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 the price we paid, um, which was the equivalent of £60 a square foot, only came back uh, towards um, the 2000s. But that's quite an interesting... Uh, um, you know. City completions, as a developer, you always look to see what the demand and supply equation is. And you can see in 1987, we knew there were only a little bit of, um, of, uh, of, of uh, space that was going to be uh, available on the market. You can see this is Broadgate and Cutler's Gardens uh, in, in here. And then there was going to be a period where there wasn't much supply. So that's why we paid top dollar in 1987. This is post-decisional rationalization. Uh, prime yields, uh, the lower the yield, the higher the price. So you can see high prices in 1987. Then the bottom fell out of the market uh, and didn't come back until, um, until, until the 2000s. So again, the same old point. If you miss that cycle, it can be really painful. The regeneration process. So what did we do? 
When we bought the site, we needed to have a master plan. A master plan, we'd have a design that we knew we could build. Well, in 1998, this was the master plan that we bought the site with. That justified paying £60 a square foot rental, and that, is, that was a very modern floor plate design. Um, Bishop's Gate up here, uh, we kept the back bit of the market, as you can see, and there was um, uh, interconnecting uh, buildings that made up the balance of the site, and we had residential along the northern boundary with Tower Hamlets, uh, because that was a cordon sanitaire with the local community. Residents against residents, because that's where people lived up here. So that's interesting. I'll show you how the world moved on. So we arrived in 1998 with exactly the wrong master plan, because uh, the world had moved on. But in that period, the Act of Parliament made sure that we had um, included within our master plan and our delivery plan uh, what's called a Section 106, a bundle of benefits that would improve the area and alleviate poverty for the local people. And that include over, included over £20 million of benefits. It included social housing on a site that I showed you a little bit uh, further in near the London Hospital. It included the requirement that all the retail, of the retail, that we had local shops um, as, as a certain percentage. You know, butcher, baker, candlestick maker, not just... Uh, Next and, um, and Boots and uh, Smiths, uh, that we would have a specialist employment brokerage to make sure that the new jobs that were created um, uh, were, were available eastwards as well as westwards. Uh, so that was a hugely important thing, that we would include community facilities uh, for a community that had no facilities at all, and that anything we built would have a local labour quotient. And uh, I'll show you how that works. So, uh, we, we, we went out of our way, outreach, to make sure that we had workers who came from the, lo the real local community uh, and that we did environmental improvements and we set up a trust uh, for local people and I'll show you how that works in a, in, a, in a second. So what did we do first? We got our Act of Parliament and we got straight on site and we built the new Spitalfields Market in Leighton near Stratford. This is it and it opened in 1991. So, so we, we'd, we'd bought the site in 87, delayed Act of Parliament, took us to um, 89, ended up with a wrong master plan, but we'd actually had to build this market for £40 million, and we moved everybody across. I remember it well. It was uh, in May 1991, over a weekend. All the traders left the old Spitalfields market, arrived at the new, and started trading the following Monday. A huge success. Uh, for £40 million. Pounds. Meanwhile, back at the, at the ranch, Spitalfield, in 1991, we were in recession. It was not an easy time. Uh, there was dereliction. Uh, there was crime. You wouldn't walk down Brushfield Street, the main uh, east-west thing, because it was really quite a dangerous part of the world. We'd re relocated the market to Leighton or, or um, uh, Stratford, as I mentioned. The market had been boarded up, and there was general lack of confidence in the area and a poor outlook for the future. And we had a scheme, as I mentioned, that was totally incompatible with what the market wants. Um, and it was about that time that Tower Hamlets, the task force from the government had been into Tower Hamlets and decided that something really needed to be done about 30% unemployment, about, it, uh, about uh, uh, the health and well-being of, of the local community. And you can see these are some of the scenes that were taken at the time. I mean, it re really was quite a dire area. So I joined, and the first thing I did is I said, well, it's going to take quite a long time, and I thought maybe five years to, for the market to recover. So I started what we called interim uses, temporary uses, and I opened up the market for interim uses. And we had all sorts of fun. We had, we had uh, sk uh, skating, we had uh, the city farm we put in there, uh, we opened it up for local shops and enterprise, and it became a hub, uh, all under the four acres of existing glass uh, that was the old market. We created um, 400 new jobs and everything we did in there we used local labour. So if we needed a shop front we went to uh, the local job centre and we said you know here's some an opportunity for people to learn carpentry skills or glazing skills. Uh, and the S SSBA stands for Spitalfield Small Business Association was set up and we helped them to get a lot of the local work and it started an engine of regeneration. Temporary uses 
really did start to have a buzz in the area. The streets were safer, more people came, and it was a destination uh, for visitors. This is the market, and the red shows how we, we started. We started with some artists, 150 artists came, and we didn't charge them rent, but at least they were there, and it, it really gave the place a real lift. And we had a few restaurants in these units here. Uh, so it was in 1992. Uh, then we, we, we slowly filled up the market. Then we designated an area here for tennis courts and football fields, um, in, all under glass. And you can see we, we put a food court in uh, to, to, do, uh, to sell uh, fresh fruit. And this is in 1994. So this was towards the end of what I thought would be temporary uses. Uh, how wrong can you be? Uh, and we also put in... Uh, would you believe it, a temporary swimming pool, which I'll show you. Um, we had an archaeological excavation there. Uh, everybody said it's a hole in the ground, and I said, no, that looks like a swimming pool. Um, so I'll show you how it worked. We, we managed to get a, um, a, a polycarbonate roof uh, that they used to um, uh, grow mushrooms in the desert in the Middle East. We bought one, uh, and we put uh, uh, a plastic liner in the, uh, uh, in the excavation, and we had a um, gas turbine to heat the water from the chimney, and I exported power to the grid. So we were the first privatized power station um, in, uh, in Great Britain. That's a swimming pool. So that, you can see, it's a plastic ducting. We had no money, um, and you can see that's, the, that's what it was. Uh, that's it being converted into a swimming pool. That's the completed swimming pool. Uh, we made our money because we charged anybody who had a suit five pounds for a swim, and if you had an E1 address, it was 50p. So this actually worked extremely well um, and uh, helped again just to get people coming to the site. And I mean, you know, health and exercise was, was very good. It was about this time that the government under uh, Michael Heseltine's leadership decided that public private partnerships were the way of the future. And uh, I, uh, 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 the Spitalfields Development Group, became the main private sector partner for what was called Bethnal Green City Challenge. So that was a pot of money. We won 35 million over seven years for the area against a whole range of programs, including education, jobs, training, um, housing, which I'll come on to later, providing we geared up three to one. So they said you could have 35 million you've got to raise over 100 million of private sector money. Sounds easy. Um, uh, and I was made the chairman. Uh, and I, I, was, I only accepted the job on condition that I could recruit my own chief executive, because uh, they did offer me someone from the council. And uh, I, I, I decided that if we were going to have such a challenge, we needed really to do something extremely robust. So I, it's all about people, and I managed to uh, persuade uh, a lady who had been involved in regeneration elsewhere called Leslie Klein, and she helped with the, you know, to manage the whole program. And we, uh, we, we managed the um, action plan, and we established credibility with the government. So, um, so that was very good. These are the, uh, the list of partners, private, public, statutory, voluntary sector partners. So these are, so I managed, I chaired a board of 25 of people, who, most of whom had never been in a boardroom in their lives. And this is, these are the sorts of projects that we got involved with, which is all about creating um, energy, creating motivation uh, within a local community. We had a swimming pool. Uh, Bangladeshi women couldn't swim because that was a male lifeguard. So we had a women um, lifeguard training session. Uh, this is just an example of, uh, they were undergoing training, and they became the lifeguard, and that opened up that whole area to a whole range of people Otherwise, you couldn't have used it. A lot of work with children, outward bound, getting them out of the city uh, into, into natural environment. A lot of training courses, computers, all the modern things that you need to play a useful role in society. A lot of the dangerous and, and, and dank spaces, we got local people, local youth clubs, to jazz them up. And this is just one of the schemes that we did. Uh, this is my, we, we got kids involved with our temporary, uh, they played basketball on our tennis courts, um, and we, we, we had a lot of fun getting the local community really engaged. It became their temporary uses. Uh, we didn't build Sainsbury's, but when Sainsbury's was built, we persuaded them to give the first 400 jobs to the local area. 
all the cash still security. All, so that was a major triumph, and I, I, I think it was just such success. City Challenge negotiating with a private sector supermarket chain saying, please look for jobs in your local community. We redid up, uh, the, the, I don't have a before and after of this, but this is the after, this is social housing. They were really derelict blocks and we redid them and they worked out really well. So what did we achieve? Um, I chaired it and then I handed over to uh, a, a councillor in Tower Hamlets. We managed to raise 139 million of private sector funding to match the 35 million, over, this is over, over, over five years. Um, we created uh, 3,288 jobs, we created new businesses, and a whole host of metrics, which, uh, including 570 new private homes. So really made a huge difference by getting the local community um, to regard this as their challenge. Now, meanwhile, back at the ranch, my shareholders were saying to me, well, okay, Bear, what are you doing? You know, you've uh, created all these jobs and you're this, having this fun in local community. What, what, about, what about this property development uh, scheme that we'd paid, they'd paid 100 million, um, 40 million for moving the market and 60 million to the corporation for the lease. So we had, during that time, we, 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 uh, we, we engaged some master planners and came up with a different master plan that was compatible with the, the, the new demand for office space. And you can see uh, from this one that it, there was a, a building on the front, um, soon to be taken by uh, Abian Amro, and it was, so it was high on the city end, cascading down on both these sides for the, because there's three conservation areas. And these buildings were capable of being linked. So this was our um, attempt at actually making a modern master plan for 1993 that could, if we got delayed again, and be able to be flexed for, for future um, uh, demand. Um, so, so that's that. And again, the cordon sanitaire, the residential against the residential in, uh, in, in uh, um, Folgate Street. Um, section 106, uh, whenever you go for a planning consent, they always add a few million on. So uh, planning, planning went up to, we hadn't built a thing, but we were up to 23 million to be spent on local community, including 118 social houses, we put £5 million into a trust for the locals, alleviation of poverty. Uh, we put, this is Tower Hamlet's at, um, uh, advanced training. And we agreed that we would also pay £7 a square foot for any future development. Local shops stayed in on subsidised rents and local construction workers. So this was a new agreement that went with that new master plan. We then... Um, were approached by a housing association and said, I know you're, you haven't started building the office element, but could we take forward the um, social housing on the site? And we said, yes, you can. We didn't have to, but yes, you can, as long as the, you credit us with the cost of it so that we don't have to pay twice. So we were going to build it, they built it, but credited us with, with, with that. So the housing was built first for, for just opposite the London Hospital and a sports centre. So immediately some advanced gains for the local community. The first private development, the Cordon Sanitaire, was done in joint venture with St. George, 187 residential units, um, and, and that uh, was a great success. Uh, the deal I did with them, because we, we were a bit short of cash, is I put in the land, they put in the construction costs, and I got 35% of every sale. So it didn't, uh, in terms of cash flow, it was, uh, it was a good deal for us and a good deal for St. George's, uh, and it worked really well. And, and, and I think the fact that we created a garden here um, was fantastic. And it's, if you go now, it is very well used um, as a breakout space for people. And we even won an award. Beware of awards. Uh, that um, Whenever we get awards, it means we've done something both right and wrong. <laughs> Probably spent too much. Then we had our first um, uh, success on the commercial front. On the frontage of the site, Avian Amro decided to move to this site, so we had to knock down what was the Neville Russell building and, uh, and, and started a, um, a development for ABN, ABN AMRO. Uh, and in order to, again, work with the local community, we gave SSBA, the small, Spitalfield Small Business Association, the rights to take whatever they wanted from the closed building. So they took the doors and the furniture and recycled. That was a start of recycling a lot of the stuff there. What we also did is we made it into a school project um, I don't, if that part of the world, if you don't get graffiti uh, soon after you start, uh, it's unusual. We got the kids involved, they had field of flags, and it was theirs. Each school 
had their own uh, row of flags and uh, we had no graffiti um, for over 10 years because this was their site. Uh, they took ownership and that was a great triumph. That's the completed AB and AMRO building, now Bank of Scot Royal Bank of uh, Scotland. Amazing how the time changed. But that was a building um, that really kick-started the commercial development um, of Spitalfields uh, on Bishopsgate, just opposite um, uh, Broadgate. And one of the design features was it framed this beautiful Hawksmoor church, uh, and so the design worked extremely well. We achieved our percentages on local labour. Uh, from 1996-97, uh, we were on just under 13%. So we, 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 we really did show that actually this wasn't just a dream. We could get local people involved in the construction. And that's a nice shot at night with the next phase um, of three buildings uh, that uh, completed the Bishopsgate frontage, uh, which we had done um, um, since 1997. Meanwhile, the market, the temporary market, uh, was flourishing as a, as a, a temporary market. And it, it was now seven years old. So a lot of people had moved into the area thinking it was permanent. So uh, when we had our next planning battle, it was ready to remove the temporary use and go back to permanent use. Uh, would I do it again? Probably yes, but uh, uh, I probably have um, a lot more support on that one. A uh, huge amount of um, local trade and interest in the temporary market, and a lot of that now is part of the permanent market. It's fashion show, we did alternate fashion week there. Um, uh, we had community festival, and that's um, playing football on the tennis fields. Um, and again, we won an award. So uh, uh, too many awards, uh, not much making money on this one. Then we had another triumph. The London International Futures and Option Exchange were looking for space, open outcry trading. They were at Cannon Street, needed a really big trading floor, and we thought this resonates. Trading markets from fruit to futures. So uh, we, uh, we, we got uh, uh, London Futures involved. We did this massive design of, of a, 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 an open outcry and a support building. Here. Again, respecting the, the master plan, high on the city end, cascading down on each end. And uh, Lon the London International Futures and Option Exchange paid us 45 million for the site. We were very happy. We managed to get planning permission, which is another battle. The battle was with taking away the temporary uses. Um, and uh, that uh, I had hair in those days, I have to tell you. One of the joys of working with Life, they were quite a forward-looking company, they did a lot of work with local schools. They set up trading platforms in Swanley School. They got the kids involved in uh, managing a, a trading platform. Uh, and, and they were actually very scaringly uh, bright and numerate, you know, buying, selling. So uh, it, it really worked extremely well. And in fact, they were prepared, had they gone ahead, to enter into a compact, an agreement, um, for access to jobs, training and brokerage, that they would buy any goods and services for their new building, had they built it, from local people, called the Supply Net Project. So um, uh, any, anything from stationery to laundry to catering would come locally. So that's what would have happened had life decided to do that. Uh, meanwhile, back at the ranch, City Challenge had ended. The government was very happy with us. We won another bid called Cityside Regeneration for another £11.5 million. And its objectives were to break down barriers, um, excluding the community from employment, uh, managing the diverse local economy and, and, and the tourist agenda. So again, we were doing a lot of regeneration work uh, in, in the area. And these are some of the projects. Um, this is Brick Lane. It was quite an awful place. It was smartened up a bit. And we bought the local community a building um, with government money. Uh, and with local uh, uh, leverage uh, called the Rich Mix Centre, which is a huge success even today. Uh, the swimming pool, um, I moved uh, to the Bishopsgate Goods Yard site, so that went into one of the arches, so everybody said temporary swimming pool, uh, you know, so we moved it and uh, it, was, it was great fun there. And we, again, we had some great achievements. It ended in 2002 with a thousand jobs and new businesses and all sorts of things, so a lot of uh, great achievements there. Uh, then I was on holiday and, uh, and uh, the chief executive of London Futures rang me and said we decided not to come to Spitalfield, <laughs> rather made my holiday. So suddenly we had, this, we had this planning permission that didn't work with anything else. Had we been there before, it took us two years to get it. 
And we decided that the only way we could manage the world was actually to do all of the essential work to shorten the time to build if somebody wanted to come to Fiddlefields. So we, went, we, we, we pressed the button on the archaeology, which was uh, 10 million pounds. Uh, so that's what we did in advance of a demand. And we found 10,000 skeletons in the area uh, because St. Mary's Spittle, the hospital fields, we hadn't realized just how many people had uh, passed through the hospital. Um, and it was also a burial ground for the plague. Uh, so some of these holes you see here actually had eight or nine um, uh, skeletons in and you could see how they'd just been tipped in. So I had 120 archeologists working for a year, um, slowly. <laughs> Uh, and this is, again, just showing you um, another shot of the uh, thing. And then horror upon horrors. What is the worst night for a nightmare for a developer? We found a sarcophagus. <laughs> so, and it, the television cameras were there in no time, and I thought, oh, no, what have I done? Um, and this was a Roman princess. Um, what she was doing there, well, she was a Roman princess, Roman road, Roman burial ground. The amazing thing was, this was a gravel pit by the side of it. So how the gravel pit diggers had missed this. I mean, that was negligent, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but uh, so, so we found this Roman princess, and I, I had to um, reach a speedy agreement with the Museum of London uh, to elegantly, with uh, toothbrushes and paintbrushes, do the analysis and, and, and move it off site, uh, which, which, which they did do. We, we, uh, and, and what we did with, the Rome, with this particular sarcophagus, because I thought it'd be exciting if we, again, we, got, we captured people's imagination, we got a um, forensic pathologist who normally does murder to actually recreate the face of this Roman princess. And this is what, she, we're not sure about the hairstyle because you, you're not quite sure, but this is what she would have looked like. Uh, and um, and uh, in fact, I said, how do you know? Um, and they said she came from Iberia. I said, how do you know that? And they said, well, we took some isotope from the tooth enamel and I said, oh, that's fine. So because that's, what, that's how you can... You can uh, it, it it, the tooth enamel is informed by the water you drink for the first 10 years of your life, or 20 years. So I'm glad it wasn't my children, because they would have come from Evier or Perrier. Or <laughs> <laughs> but in those days, uh, it was from the local spring. So this was a Roman princess. And what we also did, we set up a, 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 an, archaeo a, a, an archaeological exhibition on site. So real time, whatever was found was shown in this um, uh, uh, exhibition on site at Spitalfields. And, but I thought the, uh, the, the pathologist did a good job there. And these are just more shots of archaeology. Then another horror upon horrors, this should not have been. This was the charnel house. St. Mary's Spittal, whenever you have a cemetery, you have a chapel, a, a charnel house. And so this was not meant to be there at all, but it was. Um, it was. Um, and although we had permission to take it away, because that was part of our agreement in planning, uh, we decided that we would do the right thing, and we kept it in situ, and I'll show you how we, we kept it um, underneath the building. So we've done the archaeology. We've now come up with a different master plan, um, and this is now one that we thought would match any requirement for large floor plates, be it a professional firm or a bank, um, um, and uh, so this is so uh, the, the, the back bit of the market, the Victorian market, stayed as always. Uh, it linked in to the back of this building, and uh, we kept the uh, Horner the Horner building stayed, but the 1928 extension of the market. So if you walked past here on the human scale, you wouldn't really notice the building behind. Uh, so that was one of the triumphs. We got planning permission for this, um, and that's what it looked like. Um, these are the original buildings for the market. And behind it was this four-fingered um, um, building, which actually is a million square feet. That, in, that, in those four fingers is the same amount of space as one of the Canary Wharf towers, but broken down into four fingers, a real triumph of design by um, uh, uh, Lord Foster. In order to make sure, again, that we consulted, because consultation was key, uh, what I did was, uh, for the open spaces, um, I held a meeting with the local community and I gave them each a camera, a uh, little, you know, four pound camera that you buy from Boots. And I said, you go around London and take photographs of what you would want in your squares. And this was a consultation. And we then narrowed that down into, um, into uh, what went into the design. And we got a prelet, Alan and Overy, 
big lawyers decided to move there. We did a pre-let. We won another award, so something must have gone very wrong on that one. Uh, and they agreed to take over where life left off, Lefay, London Futures Exchange. They entered into their own compact with the local community. So uh, the building blocks we'd set in place worked really well. So to give you an idea over the time, that was the original master plan with the, uh, when we bought the site. Uh, we then moved to this master plan, which was a flexible building in 93. Uh, then London Futures Exchange came and we, you can see we, we, we put in a really big trading floor there. And then this is now the outline of the Allen and Over, if we can call it that, building there. So uh, each time it's taking us over a year, nearly 18 months, to get planning permission. But because we had a pre-let, the challenge was we had to build it for the terms that we'd agreed with Allen and Overy. Uh, so it meant we couldn't be late, but I'd done the archaeology and that was the main risk. Um, so we were, we, were, we, were onto, we were onto something really good. And that's what it looks like in the artist impression. And you can see from the human level, we'd kept the, uh, 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 the original market buildings here and added one in that funnels people through. We created a market street going down in here, a little gazebo for outside space. And this is the people, with the local committee with their camera. They said, that we want, this is what we want. So we'd actually incorporated in the public square to the extent maximum all of those elements that, um, that we want. And then we started the construction. That's what it looked like. Uh, as an engineer, I had to put these in just to, uh, uh, that's a hole in the ground, um, another hole in the ground, a bigger hole in the ground. And this, these are some, uh, it was a steel structure, we had to build it quickly, we ordered the steel from Germany, uh, wonderful shots of building it adjacent to the city, um, and this is how it looks uh, today, um, and uh, it, it works really well. And this is the charnel house underneath the entrance to um, the Allen Novi building. This is the artist's impression of how we're going to do it, and this is how it turned out. The crypt of St. Mary, if you go to Spitalfields, you can go down. Uh, there's an olive, there's a, a, an olive tree. You can actually sit and you can, you can get a view of what it would have looked like all those years ago. And that is a typical street, uh, street scene in Brushfield Street. So within um, 20 years from being one of the most dangerous streets uh, in E1, it is now one of the most popular um, and uh, it frames the church, so it's a, a real triumph. Uh, the, the building had um, green roofs. Uh, this is the breakout space for Alan Novery, and this was just a wonderful shot of uh, reflection from the church. Um, the, 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 the old market meeting the new market um, and Market Street. Uh, down here you can see the church uh, reflected, all very deliberate, very tranquil, and, and a great piece of master plan design. So having finished the project, we then had to spend the balance of the monies and we, we uh, agreed with Tower Hamlets where they would be best um, applied. And they, these are the sorts of, you know, we did play spaces, uh, we did Omani Center, where is it, Youth Center, refurbishment, market improvements, a huge um, improvement in the local area. Uh, and so um, that really worked extremely well. Uh, CCTV and street improvements, hugely important because uh, crime rate has really dropped enormously there. So in addition to the city challenge benefits, this is what the regeneration of Spitalfields um, produced. Another 6,500 jobs, um, lots of retail for local people, four acres of open space, and uh, completion of a regeneration strategy that local people felt that they'd been listened to um, and uh, developers should be trusted. So education levels, I've shown you this before. I know we're not responsible, but I think this is such a wonderful graph. It went up. So, uh, uh, and employment, uh, this is unemployed people in 1991. And you can see unemployed people have shrunk. Uh, again, not only us, but generally, we were part of what was happening in the area, in the city fringe, uh, the alleviation of poverty, the creation of opportunity in the area. So what about the future? Uh, having done this, we decided that this was a good model. Um, and as far as uh, the city was concerned, the, the city was happy because Spitalfields had become a valve of expansion um, of, of the city and they were looking for other um, types. So the trend of employment in the city, it's had a few little bumps recently, but there has been an overall growth of about 1.75% uh, since 1971. Um, 
Uh, currently over 300,000 people employed in the city, as you know, about 9,000 live within the square mile, but um, uh, it is projected to grow. Now, whether it's going to hit 428,000 by 2026, I think that's probably um, a good estimate because the big towers we're building uh, increase the density um, of office space and uh, within um, 15 to 20 years, you could well find the city expanding. We, we are very well respected internationally. We are a global centre and we have to grow to remain competitive. New projects. So we're now looking to see what else we can do. Um, Spittle, if you start at the bottom, Spitalfields uh, at Bishop Square is the Alan Overy building within Spitalfields were the catalyst for some of these other developments. And this is what they are. There's, there's Spitalfields. Uh, I, I'm now uh, working on the Goods Yard site, the Bishopsgate Goods Yard site, uh, Nichols and Clark here, um, and uh, uh, Northgate. So the, these are the sites that are, um, are on the next in line after Spitalfields here to continue the regeneration of the area and create, as I said, opportunity um, uh, for local people uh, to, um, to Im improve the work prospects, to improve their quality of life, um, and, and health. So this is a typical day. If you went to Spitalfields now, something would be going on in the market. Here's a fashion show. We have lots of things for elderly people, uh, senior citizens. We have art classes. And we have these wonderful ponds that the local people wanted. Um, and that's a shot of the, uh, the Horner buildings, the uh, revamped um, Victorian market at the back. So that is um, a whistle stop. Um, I'm not sure how long that was. That was a very long time. Um, but, uh, but anyway, that gives you an idea of um, what, what is possible um, uh, when you, um, for, you have unintended consequences. You have more time to actually do temporary uses, um, and, but it worked out really well. And what we're doing on the goods yard site is exactly the same. We are opening up the site uh, to make it a safer area to get local people involved and to make it their site and the same with the others. So that is Spitalfields. When you go there, um, and, I, and they're desperate for your custom, um, you will see that uh, uh, it, it, uh, it, it, uh, you'll see, you, you will now know the road map that got us uh, to that point. Now I did promise the provost that I was going to allow some questions. And there's only one rule, they have to be easy questions. <laughs> Well, as a user of uh, the Spitalfields market, I'm very enthusiastic about it, and I, I think it was a terrific job. Um, and I'm curious to see, with the Bishopsgate Goods Yard, I mean, that's had a very long gestation period. Um, I wonder if you could just highlight some of the challenges on that one and what you think will unlock it. Um, um, well, if you thought Spitalfields was difficult, the Goods Yard site is, is a quantum moor because it, the boundary between Tower Hamlets and Hackney goes through, uh, through it. So we actually have to get two local authorities that have, have not normally spoken to each other very much to agree uh, things. So what we are doing, um, on the western side, we are looking to put a mixed use but commercially driven development, and on the eastern side towards Brick Lane to put um, residential. But what has happened there since I got involved is Balfour BT, another company I'm involved with, built the East London line, so it's actually now got a railway station. It's got a locus. So what we're going to be doing is on Bethnal Green Road, on the north side of the site, along the spine, we will be putting in temporary retail units. And again, doing the same thing, getting people to use the site and feel it's theirs. So create a destination first and then follow on with Absolutely, the permanent development. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the uh, the inter interim measures that you put in place before the development start all look very worthwhile and interesting and fun and I was wondering how that translated afterwards were they sustainable you know what happened to the swimming pool was it reproduced somewhere else what happened to all the activities the city farm were they did they were they sustained did they go on um, some of them did and if we start with the ones that are were the easiest to deal with the stall holders in the original market became shopkeepers so they were given first option for the perimeter shops so, so, that was, so that was actually moving as their businesses got better. Um, as far as the swimming pool is concerned, it moved um, from the, um, uh, the, the archaeological excavation on Spitalfields to the goods yard site. Uh, from the goods yard site, I'm afraid it's, uh, we haven't found another place for it, but, so I'm afraid we've, we've lost a temporary swimming pool. 
Um, was the whole thing sustainable? I think that probably um, maybe 40% of, of, um, of the uses uh, were, um, were used and probably about 20% of the balance in some shape or form. But you've asked a very good question. That has got to be the challenge, is that people see interim uses as a ladder of opportunity for the future. Um, but, but, I mean, for instance, the artists that we had who were paying no rent at all, uh, that was not sustainable, and I had a big battle with them. <laughs> I have to tell you, when I told them, could they please move after five years, they said no. <laughs> and they, for people who had no money, they had the most expensive lawyers in town. So, uh, you know, it, it, uh, <laughs> it, 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 uh, it, was, it was hard, and I felt for them. I married an artist. <laughs> so, uh, but, um, uh, but, but what happened is they then moved to the Truman's Brewery, which was another site, sorry, another site. Um, and uh, many of them are now very successful artists and can afford to pay some rent somewhere, I'm sure. But that's a very good question. Sustainability is what it's all about. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, at the back. The Bishopsgate Goods Yard and the railway arches were much discussed some while ago, yes. attracting the attention of even the Prince of Wales. How sensitively are you retaining the historical architecture to merge it with the development, rather as you have sensitively preserved the St Mary's Spittal crypt on the Bishop Square site? Um, the answer is very. We have Prince Charles very um, uh, 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 ever-present. Um, the, the brickwork of the... Uh, that's a very good point, you're very well informed. The, the, the Braithwaite, Braithwaite arches... Uh, were listed. So there's a spine going down the middle of the goods yard site that has to be preserved. It's listed. So what we've done under the planning guidance, we did a plan, master plan, is retain it and use the arches themselves as artisan managed workspace units. Um, and uh, uh, so, so the answer is yes. And we will have a street, go so they'll be accessible from both sides. But that is the challenge. We've got Terry Farrell, who's a famous architect, actually um, charged with that very point to make sure that we are proud of what um, uh, um, they, are, they are retained for. Right, was that, yeah, I think we're going to just have two more and then I'm afraid... Um... Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor, for your, for your lecture today. I'm, I'm curious how, the, how you managed the cash flow of the project because it <laughs> seems you had so many architects' designs and, and had to excavate and, and all of that. I, I'm, yeah, I'm amazed how, how you kept afloat with the... Uh, well, that, um, that, that is a very insightful question. When, when I took over uh, as chief executive in 91, we had managed to spend £168 million. Pounds. That's acquiring the lease from the city, building the new market, paying £18 million pounds of uh, fees, and uh, setting up all of these trusts. Uh, now, for those of you who are as old as I am, you'll remember that interest rates in 91 was about 15%. So the interest charge that I was paying was £2,000 an hour. So we had to have a word with our banks and we did a debt for equity uh, restructuring. Um, so we bought ourselves some time um, and, uh, the, and, and two of the companies, Costain and, um, and uh, London Enterprise Trust, uh, took write-downs on their balance sheet. Um, so it was a, quite a painful time. Uh, but that was the only way. This, this uh, went on much longer than we anticipated in very hostile market conditions. When the site was purchased in 87, it was supposed to be completed by 1994. You know, that was the program using that first master plan that I showed you, but it was just not to be. So um, it was not... Um, it's like a lot of these really big developments. The first, the visionary developers uh, aren't the ones who make a lot of money. It's always the second ones who come in. So uh, Hammersons have made a lot of money. I hope none of my colleagues have made it. <laughs> uh, but not the first one. Uh, one last question and then, uh, yes. Hi. Um, to what extent was the response of the local population critical and what were they most critical of? The, sorry, the? Um, the response of the local population. Right. Um, um, the local, the local population, um, you're talking the, the uh, protest movement against us. Well, first of all, um, and they, they went through metamorphosis themselves. The, the first group, which was Save Spitalfields from the Developers, this was the fruit and veg market, they said, well, 
if the city is moving the fruit and veg market to Leighton, they didn't realise we'd paid for it, uh, we'd like those buildings, please. And could it be a giant community centre? So they were, really didn't want the city to expand. They didn't realise that there was a situation where we could have a win-win. So they were very nervous about expansion of the city. Uh, the second group of protesters, which is when we got our third planning permission, uh, uh, formed themselves under the, 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 the acronym SMUT, Spitalfields Market Under Threat. Um, and and that, was a, a, that was, again, a single, single focus um, movement, which again uh, wanted um, the, the site for, for local use um, and would have liked the artist to stay and it to be a, a, a kind of um, a, a subsidised rent um, four-acre space. But unfortunately, um, that's not how it could be. So those were... Anyway, I, 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 I'm afraid I have to uh, call time. Um, Mr. Provost. <laughs> Mike, thank you so much for an absolutely fascinating lecture, uh, full of information. Um, I'm sure that none of us have been able to take it all quite in, but I would remind you that along with all the other Gresham lectures, it will appear on our website and I guess will greatly add to the million downloads that we received of our lectures uh, in a year. But um, I think this is a... Um, for Mike, it clearly is a great labour of love. For me, in a sense, this is a, a journey back. I first came to the City of London, uh, into City of London Polytechnic, as it then was, in 1988, and therefore saw both the dereliction of the area and the poverty that Mike began with, and over the years, the, the transformation which has been wrought by Mike and his colleagues. So uh, I think we should celebrate by visiting, if you haven't already done so, Spitalfields, remember what, you've seen the pictures, what it was like, and see what Mike has wrought. So thank you so much indeed for your lecture and for all you've done.